I can't get enough. Got a space in my tackle box, just got to fill it up. More love, I can't ever stop. Don't got a basement, got an underground tackle shop. And here are the hosts of the Lore Love Podcast. John, Crappy Hippie King, and Tim, Tackle Box Beat. Hey, thanks, Lucy. Hey, Tim, what did you dress up for on Halloween? Well, I was going to dress up as a size 24 Mayfly Emerger fly, but that is a tiny fly, and I'm six feet tall, so I really didn't think I could pull it off. But I was taking out the trash, and a great idea hit me. I have a pair of red one-piece flannel pajamas, and I put those on. And I put a black winter hat on and I pulled it down over my eyes. And then I hung two metal trash can lids around my neck. Well, so what were you? Well, obviously I was a glass water angling, double underspin angle King. Oh man. Right on, right on. I can see it now, but how could you see with your hat pulled down over your eyes? Well, that was the problem, John. I got snagged quite a few times walking past fences and mailboxes, but eventually I made it home. What did you dress up as? I dressed up as a post-spawn zombie chum salmon, okay? But you know what? I think the salmon head, which I, I made from real salmon skin, I, it did something to my scalp or something. It, it's all red and, and peeling. You know, now it's flaking, and I guess some of my hair is frizzled. I mean, Kathy says my head looks like it got fried in a skillet. I, I Do you think it was the salt formaldehyde cure I used on my salmon head mask that might have caused, like, a reaction? I guess the crappy hippie didn't listen to the last episode after all. That's for the best. I'm sure that's what it was. Absolutely, John. It must have been that. <laughs> hey, you didn't ask me what I was for Halloween. Oh, okay, Lucy. Well, uh, what did you dress up as for Halloween? I went as the Hell 9000 from the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey. I love that movie, and especially the Hell 9000. What a computer. Did you wear a costume? I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Wow, you have that voice down perfectly. Well, Hal, do you think the crappy hippie and I could do this podcast without you? This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. I think we could do the podcast without you. I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. Wow, Lucy, you are really good. This conversation can serve no purpose anymore. Okay, okay, I guess we better get on with this podcast then. Uh, in this episode, we're talking about Thanksgiving and fishing lures. Well, we eat turkey at Thanksgiving, and I found a great YouTube video from Nick from the 618 Fishing YouTube channel, and he uses a massive two-pound turkey leg as bait. It was a $17 bait. Whoa, that's pretty pricey. Did he catch anything on it? Yeah, he was fishing below a spillway and he hooked a huge fish with his turkey leg, but unfortunately the fish got off. But later in the episode, he caught a channel cat on a live shad and he also caught a huge bowfin on a shad. You don't eat shad for Thanksgiving and shad is bait, not a lure. This is the Lure Love Podcast, not the Hunt of Bait Podcast. Get focused, guys. Tim, a turkey leg is great, but you know what? I saw a YouTube video where Captain Matt Budd went fishing for Goliath Grouper using a whole turkey. Now, a whole turkey is a much bigger story than a turkey leg. How did that work with a whole turkey? Well, they hooked the whole turkey on a big old hook. and uh, But in my opinion, maybe the biggest turkeys were on the boat because I kind of have a thing about... Uh, big game fishing and, and uh, these Goliath groupers and, and the Atlantic giant and all these are, are getting scarce. And, you know, he's not the only guy down there. And I just get these people that parade themselves along disturbing these fish and yanking them up just so they can get the Instagram picture and all that. I, I just don't go for thrill seeking at a thousand bucks a trip. I mean, I don't want to be a downer and I don't want to yuck somebody else's yum, but in general, I'm not into big game fishing. Yeah, the Goliath grouper, they almost went extinct 30 years ago from overfishing and from pollution. And they typically weigh about 400 pounds, um, but it's only catch and release currently. There's talk, though, of them having an annual lottery so that people can actually harvest some of them. Guys, you are getting off track. This is ridiculous. Did you forget what this podcast is about? Well, John, I saw another YouTube video where a guy was fishing at a pond and a turkey tried to attack him. Oh, come on. Stop this nonsense. Did the turkey win? 
Now the guy waved his fishing rod to get the turkey to back off. Don't make me pull a HAL 9000 and take over this podcast. We need to talk about lures. Okay, Lucy. You're familiar with Berkeley Gulp Live minnows and other gulp baits, right? Yes, I'm quite familiar with those. And you know they make a saltwater shrimp bait? Yes, I'm looking at it right now on their website. Well, here's my question. If Berkeley made a gulp alive two pound turkey leg, could we talk about that? Affirmative, Tim. That would fit within the mission of this podcast. But Berkeley does not make a gulp alive two pound turkey leg. Okay, what about turkey feathers? If turkey feathers were used to make lures, could we talk about that? Yes, that would be acceptable. <laughs> okay, great. So we get to talk about jig feathers and birds and so forth. I'm telling you right now, uh, since we're talking about feathers, the most popular fiber for crappie jig tails is marabou, at least the most popular natural uh, uh, material. But what is marabou and where does it come from? Well, originally it was taken from a bird named the marabou stork. Uh, Lucy, could I trouble you for a few quick facts on the marabou stork? I just a Wikipedia article or some such, please. No trouble at all. One moment. Okay, I have perused more than 2,000 articles, blog posts, fact sheets, and websites for information. According to a variety of sources, the marabou stork is a bird common to Africa, breeding in the north and residing in all but the furthest north or south parts of the continent. It is an opportunistic and highly adaptable bird that, like many scavengers, can coexist with humans quite well. Its head is featherless, like that of a vulture, and for the same reason. When ripping the entrails out of a decomposing cow, a scavenger bird often ends up covered in blood and gore. Thus feathers would be a detriment, whereas a skin head is easier to maintain. Just ask Tim. He has a skin head. Anyway, these birds can be found in both wet and dry environments, and often make use of landfills as a source of nutrition. I do not think I would like to eat this bird for Thanksgiving. Oh, no way. The image of a stuffed roast marabou stork is going to haunt my mind forever. Thanks for that, Lucy. My pleasure, Tim. Just look at that thing. I doubt even the babies would be cute. Oh, don't worry. I ain't going to eat one or raise it either. <laughs> but as far as eating goes, the turkey bird is what I'm having on turkey day. And turkey boo is what I tie my jester jigs with. So I'm doing a little story on marabou. So clear the road, y'all. The Boo Feather Express is about to roll through. See, although originally used as a fashion item, marabou feathers were quickly adopted by the salmon and trout anglers of the 19th century to make streamers for fly casting and trolling. As early as 1851, at the great exhibition of the works of industry of all nations, uh, there was a note written uh, about the display there that uh, shortages of marabou stork feathers could be compensated by through the use of turkey feathers. They make a great substitute because of their appearance and their ability to take dye. But the big uh, go-over from using marabou stork feathers to turkey feathers came when a clever entrepreneur gave a man a chance to get back on his feet. I found this story on the Wapsi website. Wapsi? What's Wapsi? Is that like TikTok? Uh, kind of. I mean, no, wait, no, uh, nothing like that at all. Uh, uh, it's one of the biggest fly and jig tying material distributors in the world. Current owner, Tom uh, Schumacher, posted this little account, very novel account, very fun account, on the decision to add domestic turkey feathers to the Wapsi line back in the 40s. Wapsi founder Lacey Gee was an ardent fly tire, and he really liked marabou for certain patterns. He also had some experience with raising turkeys, and had noticed how similar the feathers on a turkey were to those harvested from the marabou stork halfway around the world. So he wanted to exploit the similarity by sourcing his favorite feathers locally, but circumstances prevented him from following this project through. Well, fate lended a hand, and one day in 1946, one of his old buddies stopped in at Lacey's operation in Independence, Iowa. He was down on his luck and asked Lacey for a hundred bucks to tie him over. Well, in classic entrepreneurial fashion, Lacey handed him the hundred and two mail sacks. He knew John was from Colfax, Iowa, and there was a big poultry processing plant there. Lacey told John to get on down there, and he told him where to look on the bird, where to harvest the feathers from on the big white hybrid turkeys that were the mainstay of the burgeoning industrial farming landscape. He had to get in there and uh, get with the owner of the processing plant and had to be able to find the right feathers. Now, which feathers were those? The best feathers for tying jigs and bugs are found on the lower third of the bird. So turkey hiney, huh? That seems to be one of many colloquial terms for that area. But Tim, please allow me to continue. By all means. The feathers are located where they insulate the bird as well as facilitating egg incubation by helping the hen's body heat stay on the nest, 
while also cushioning the eggs from the weight of the mother bird. Hey, it's a righteous system, no doubt. Anyhow, John figured it all out. He filled them two sacks, and he hauled them back to Lacey in exchange for the money. Wopsy started selling marabou all over the place, and John developed his own business called the Colfax Feather Company. Eventually, John had 18 different plants supplying boo. Give a man a turkey feather, and he'll just stick it in his hat. Teach a man where to find the good stuff for lure making, and he'll lift himself out of poverty. Right on, right on, right on. Now, uh, before we get going too far, uh, I don't want to assume, you know, that everybody knows what marabou is, but uh, if you only fish with plastics or so on in your, in your crop fishing, but uh, a lot of you do know it's, it's that fluffy uh, feather that you see on road runners. You see it on jigs, you see it on a lot of things. And uh, um, it's a great action underwater and um, especially crappie people tend to prefer it, or at least a lot of us do because of its durability and its fish catching ability as well. It's almost like it breathes when marabou is under the water, it expands and contracts and it almost looks like a live organism to me. I see that both the fashion and fishing industry still refer to these sort of turkey feathers as marabou, but why do you think that is, John? Well, it's probably a combination of things, but marketing mostly. I mean, you know, come on, they're so similar. You really can't tell a marabou stork feather from a turkey feather unless you're a scientist or something. So, you know, I'm sure they were thinking, why cause confusion? And, you know, the free market is very fond of playing fast and loose with animal names when it comes to products harvested. Coyote fur becomes Siberian wolf on a coat. Uh, Patagonian toothfish becomes Chilean sea bass in a restaurant and turkey feathers get left to be called marabou feathers just because that makes them easier to sell. I mean, believe me, Tim, I've tried to get turkey boo to catch on. Okay. <laughs> but all it does is get me a bunch of strange looks and dudes going, what's that? Or y'all mean marabou? And that's all I get for my trouble. So I may have to abandon that crusade. So I assume there's a lot of different kinds of turkeys. What kinds of turkeys are we talking about for the, the marabou feathers? Well, the big white hybrids are preferred for a lot of reasons. Their feathers are more durable. Uh, they're, uh, the white feathers also are handy because they don't have to be bleached, although you can bleach them to get what's called bright white. Since it's a white background, the dyes come out you know, true. Um, and, and actually, the reason they were bred, though, was because pin feathers that get left behind in the meat don't show up so readily with a white feather as they would, say, with a black feather or something, where you'd have these little kind of little strands of little specks of black, gray, or brown um, on your turkey breast, which most people don't want. And what's a pin feather? John and I will return to this topic again in the future and discuss processing, feather typing, and patterns that require these amazing quills. But we do not have time today to venture too far into all the pertinent information on these essential materials. Can I ask one more question? By all means. Can wild turkey feathers be used? No, oh, you bet. Boo harvested from a fresh gilled turkey will still have oils and such on its coat. So keep that in mind. Uh, you know how bird feathers have some oil on there to keep the feathers water resistant. But I don't think it affects the action much or is not adversely affect the action. But the whole thing is whenever you use unprocessed feathers, whether you get them off a pheasant or a duck or a turkey or whatever, just, you know, put them in the freezer for a few days uh, in case there is any insects or eggs on it. And then uh, seal them in a ni um, nice tight like Ziploc or something because they're attractive to moths uh, when they're in the more natural state. So if you have a friend that hunts turkeys or you like to hunt turkeys, don't miss out on this cheap source of materials. I mean, there's some awesome gray tones to be had, and you can actually get into washing and dyeing them. Uh, there's books on the topics. One by AK Best is, is very much re uh, uh, renowned. Um, so when you get your turkey home, just pull off those uh, lower third, you know, those, those belly and, and bun feathers and put them in a paper sack to dry out for a few days and zip lock them freeze them for a few days, and then put them in your material cabinet where nothing can get in them, and you'll be able to use them for years and years and years. Uh, but don't just take the fluff off the buns and belly. Tail and wing feathers can be used too. You know, that reminds me of something. Lucy, would you please tune in that old radio? I do believe it's time for KLUR. Good evening, America. It's KLUR Radio. K-L-U-R, where we flash, wobble, and roll. The year is 1936, and the greatest band on the stand right now is the Sculpins with their hit song, Muddler Minnow. Welcome to K-L-U-R Lure History Radio. I'm your host, Tim Tacklebox Beat. 
Today, we're going to explore the origins of one of the most popular fly patterns ever created. Not only does it have a fabulous name, but it also uses mottled and banded turkey tail and wing feathers in its construction. I am, of course, talking about the muddler minnow. Now, John, when I think about the muddler minnow, to me, what it looks like is if you got a, a, a badminton birdie and it was brown, and then you stuck a feather wing off the back of it. It has kind of a tight head with the things kind of sprouting off it and that feather on the back. What do you, how would you describe a muddler minnow? Well, that's exactly right. I mean, it's essential uh, parts or it has to have uh, some sort of head or what they call a forend on it um, of some sort of clipped hair. Uh, I don't know. It, it, it makes a real wide profile. Okay. That has, it has an underwing and, and a wing. So it, it, it's a full body. I mean, it's a full wing lure has a flashy body on it. it. Yeah. The profile is the important thing because it's not only looks like something with wings, but as it's pulled through the water, those wings kind of, you know, kind of give you some action. They kind of pop up and down because the things you make a muddler out of are buoyant. So it's going to have a, maybe kind of a crawdad pop in action, or it looks kind of like a, you know, something propelling itself through the water. It, it, it's, um, it's a, it's a great lure and, um, the standard versions are one of the most recognizable flies in, in the box. Now, John, when you brought up this bug as a topic, you talked about its evolution in the fifties, in the fifties, Montana trout scene and fly fishing legend, Dan Bailey was certainly the one who popularized the fly fly fishing and travel was experiencing this huge upswing with a new mid century leisure class. And Bailey's fly shop in Livingston, Montana was a destination for a lot of anglers who were trying to discover the Western waters of our great nation. And one of the most recommended patterns was Dan's version of the muddler minnow. However, it wasn't Dan who invented it. What, huh? Lucy, can you set the scene for us? Oh, thank you, Tim. This will give me a chance to try out my literary skills. You know I long to be an outdoor writer like you someday. Ah, Lucy, cut it out. I'm blushing. Oh, is he ever? I mean, he's turning a weird shade of blotchy pink. I mean, man, if I ever saw a pack of hot dogs that looked like that, you know, I probably wouldn't buy them. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. They might be good for bait, though. But then, you know, if I bought them and took them out, I, you know, I'd be afraid I'd accidentally eat one because I get hungry when I'm fishing sometimes, you know. But, you know, if I had a pack of grape jello and some crushed up Crappy garlic, hippie, please. Your stream of consciousness moment is preventing me from setting the scene. Oh, whoa, yo, whoa, you're right. Oh, sorry, Lucy, sorry. The moon looks down on a riverbank in a far northern land. From the silver lit waters rises the sound of gentle current. Nearby, the quiet hiss of an oil lantern, and there in the small circle of light, a white man listens attentively to the murmuring voices of three First Nation fishing guides. Cupped in the glistening wet hands of one of the guides is a small, brown fish. The secret of the river's ability to produce enormous brook trout is introduced to the mind of a creator. With one last studied look, the listener purposefully reaches for a portable fly tying kit. As the guide turns toward the riverbank to release the little fish, the other two watch with curious wonder as a powerful lure is built right before their eyes. The river is Ontario's Nipigon, the visitor is fly-tying icon Dan Gapin, and the year is 1936. Well, I'll be. So there you have it, John. The lure was not invented out west, but in the Northland in the Thunder Bay region of Lake Superior. But the legacy remains the same. This is a fly for big trout wherever it's fished. You see, Gapin had built a fishing lodge on the Nipigon River, and he wanted a fly his guests could use to catch those big brookies that got that way by eating the slimy brown sculpin. Ooh, slimy brown sculpin, eh? Oh, boy, another dish for the nightmare Thanksgiving table, a big bowl of steaming slimy brown sculpins. Oh, man, that's another image now I'm not going to be able to get out of my head. Well, let me help you out, Tim. Okay. I mean, the fly's not gross. Look, it's cool. And, and it uh, makes a tasty treat to so many species of fish. Indeed. This pattern is eagerly accepted by largies, smallies, whites, rockfish, peas, rainbows, browns, brookies, dollies, cutthroats, lakers, bulls, goldens, char, grayling, steelhead, sunnies, bluegills, shell crackers, walleyes, pike, musky, snook, tarpon, redfish, and even crappies just to name a few off the top of my data banks. It does seem to mimic a lot of different creatures in various forms. Yes, 
It is tied many different ways and has become more of a base principle of fly tying logic than a single fly. The spuddler, muddler hopper, Mizolian spook, Circe muddler and keel muddler are just a few of the patterns that have evolved out of the original gape and tie. These variations are composed to imitate a wide variety of forage such as sculpins, crayfish, leeches, grasshoppers, crickets, spent mayflies, emerging green drakes, stonefly nymphs, mice, tadpoles, shrimp, dace, shiners, chubs, minnows and a plethora of other bait fish in fresh and salt. Ooh, that's a nice list there, Lucy, and you are spot on with it. Uh, but before we range too far afield, let's go over some basics of both the gapin and bailey ties. Well, the gape and tie is very simple and somewhat sparse and kind of woolly looking. The key characteristics are the underwing of gray squirrel tail, the turkey feather wing, and a body of tinsel. But the most identifiable feature of the muddler minnow is its head or fore end. And that's created of spun deer hair that's clipped into shape. When I talked about it looking like a badminton birdie. That's that red head you would see on the on the badminton birdie. It's that aspect, that spun or that built up forend leading to a full double winger body that ties all the variations together. Extremely well said, Tim. Extremely well said. Now, Bailey got hold of Gavin's pattern and it was pretty easy for him to get it because Gavin had a fly tying business and did a lot of stuff through mail order. So Bailey took a look at it. Uh, but then of course he did a little bit and what he was looking for was to imitate the big grasshoppers that he'd see buzzing out ahead of him as he crossed the meadow towards his favorite river up there in Montana in the summertime. So the pattern got browner and more compact and more buoyant. Uh, the head or fore end of deer hair became fuller and more tightly clipped into shape. And deer hair was allowed to stream back as part of a wing of deer hair and then combined with a squirrel tail and the turkey feathers. Uh, this bait on a six or four would entice some fine summertime trout to rise for a luxury breakfast or lunch, much to their demise. I just love it as a fly because it's big. You It bass like it too. It does look like a big grasshopper or a cicada or some big bug just kind of battling to try to get out of that surface of the water. And you can really see with this profile that it could be used in a lot of different um imitations and variations i've seen some tied with marabou wings which i now know is actually turkey boo but i've seen some saltwater monsters with foam heads and wild hackle and flashaboo wings tied in white or pink for bigger fish uh you know the big fish that inshore fly anglers chase and uh you said a, a number six or four well i've heard of freshwater fishers swing in size two all the way to two watt and these are for big bull trout and muskies, hog bass, and so forth that feed on uh, mice or small muskrats. And it really does look like a mouse. Sometimes you'll see a mouse fly, and it, it, the head of it looks pretty similar um, to this. They're generally tied darker and fuller. Some of them have tails on them. I've even seen muddler minnow ties on big plastic worm hooks. So the point rides up, giving them kind of a bottom bouncing capability without as many hangups. Ooh, I like the sound of that. That sounds like a little crawfish imitation. Somebody hand me that crawfish dip over there. Oh, wait a minute. Is dip scent illegal in fly fishing? Actually, my sensors indicate the Fly Angling Purity Enforcement League siren just went off, and they've sent a squad car to apprehend you for suggesting that a fly be dipped in a scent. Oh, boy. Uh, Tim, Lucy, Lucy, Lucy sensing sirens. What are we going to do? This looks like a good time to tie things up and get crappy hippie into hiding. Thanks to all the listeners for tuning into K-Lure, K-Lure Radio, where we flash, wobble, and roll. That segment was much better than I expected. Good job, John. <laughs> hey, thanks, Lucy. Now, let me ask you a question here. I don't want to get going without your permission, but can we talk about fish that eat birds and bird lures? It is not only okay, it is about time. Cool. Okay, so there's a great YouTube video of a giant trevally eating birds off the surface and even coming out of the water to catch them out of midair. It's amazing that a GT has a brain that can calculate the airspeed, altitude, and trajectory of a bird. Um, have I told you this story, Tim? I can't find the video, but somebody on the Face Nerds, the Fish Nerds Facebook group uh, posted a, a video of a guy catching a giant trevally on a fly that he made. I mean, it looks like a stuffed seagull. I don't know if it's an actual stuffed seagull or he built up a seagull out of I don't know, out of a hand puppet or something, but he has an assistant. He has a second and there's somebody shooting the film and he's standing there and he waves his hand and the second just 
kind of uh, pendulum swings that two or three times and then throws that thing into the surf. And I mean, as minute it hits the water, there's a giant explosion. And that guy, that fly angler's hooked up. Or as my friend Jeff Danielton would say, he's bent to the cork, man. And, you know, that's all <laughs> clear and over. I have seen that video and I've actually binge watched giant trevally eating these birds it is incredible first they get in shallow water near the surf like you say but also to watch these things come out of the water and take a bird out of midair is just mind-blowing and then you see this burst of feathers as they um, take them back under it's one of the most incredible videos i've ever seen okay so we know you can make a crazy uh crazy giant fly and catch a giant trevally but you can catch them on a lot of things there's a lot of lures out there that imitate birds um i saw a trevally video where a guy's fishing a 3d suicide duck and that's made by savage gear and it's one heck of a lure uh for pike for bass for whatever uh, i love so many things about the design it has a large treble hook in the bottom front and then another one that's just hanging there on the center of the back of the duck um so anything that's going to bite that bite that try to bite that thing in two is going to get hooked on that uh top uh hook and that hook uh, keeps up out of the weeds and all kinds of stuff it's a great idea and then when you reel the duck its feet spin in the water leaving a heck of a wake it, it's it's just wonderful and it has a few feathers covering the travel hooks for a little realism and uh you can attach the line to the beak and the little run with a low posture in the water like a duckling trying to hide and escape at the same time or you can attach the line to the chest and the little run higher more of a panic you know uh fleeing action of you know, across the top of the water. So it can be fished fast, it can be fished slow, it can be twitched, it can have a steady retrieve, long yanking pulls, anything you think helps it imitate a duck or something trying to get the heck out of there because here comes a predator. I mean, bass, pike, musky, big catfish, and of course, GTs will all take a swipe at this amazing lure. John, you mentioned big catfish and uh, and bird lures. This is a little bit off topic, but I was fishing with a vintage Zara spook earlier this year, big, you know, five inches long, and a huge channel cat took that lure off the surface. The water exploded. It was like a freight train hitting it. And so I am so looking forward to fishing the duck lure that I bought next summer. Oh, 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 when you go out with that duck lure, you better have a camera with you, boy, because I want to see that video. I want to see that blow up. I can't wait to see what you get on that thing. Then there's the chase bait smuggler bird lures, and these are on my list to buy. I don't have one yet. And while they look similar, they have these great bird names like the finch, the budgie, the cockatoo, and these are bass baits. The smuggler is kind of like a, a water blooping, rattling walker with a lifelike swimming bird action because of its wings. It has a long trailing tail to simulate tail feathers, colors that imitate most of the different birds that big fish feed on, although I don't think that the bass really care what color the thing is. When they just see that blooping action and that struggling wing action, they're all in. Well, those, yeah, keep on, keep going. I want to hear more about the action. You, you know, what kind of action does this thing have? So as you, you walk the smuggler across the water, the wings splash. They kind of go back and forth and, and dip into the water. And uh, then you just hang on for dear life because the lure comes in two and a half and three and a half inch sizes, which I like. So it's not like the suicide duck. It's not a massive lure. It's much smaller, like a small bird. But that means you can fish for more species with it. They're a little bit smaller than some of these other big bird lures. And they're fitted with a single large treble hook, which I also like. So you're not dealing with, you know, two or three huge treble hooks. And the smaller lure, it weighs six tenths of an ounce. So it's not, you don't need a, a huge saltwater gear, you know, bait casting rig to be able to cast these things. And the larger one. Can I have one? Of, wait a minute. Can I have one that's three fifths of an ounce? Three. <laughs> Never mind. You are a math genius. <laughs> <laughs> so you can get the, uh, they have a six tenths version or the three fifths, John. You can buy either <laughs> one of those. And they also have one that's just under about an ounce and a half. So two very good sizes. The, the difficult thing for a bird lure, though, is getting those wings right. It's really a very difficult design problem to be able to solve. Yeah, actually, I, while you were chatting there, I, I pulled up vid and I'm watching it and I love that that tip tap tip tap you know kind of action you know it's very very uh uh crazy uh action on it it it, it I, I so you know i know this is an audio medium and i wish you guys could see this but 
Are you talking the wings, the wings give it, it, it dips one wing than the other rolls from side to side. It, it is really interesting. And I'm not sure, uh, what they're doing there. Uh, you got any ideas on that, Tim? I don't know for sure. I will put the video in the show notes so that you can watch it, but they, first of all, they have the weight just right. But I, I think it has something to do with the resistance. When one of those wings dips in the water, you know, it swings it to that side and then just enough so that then with the weight, it pops out in the end, it sinks down and the other one catches it. But it's really is a design feat. I'm guessing you could design a thousand of these things and they wouldn't work the same way because the, the wings wouldn't dip in the way they do. I also suspect they may have a spring or a little bit of give on those wings in the joint to allow them to go back a little bit further. But I, I can't tell for sure from the video. Well, oh man, you lay down the 20 bucks for one. You're going to be willing to cut it in two. Well, I, I may at least bend the wing back, but I, I, it's definitely on my Christmas list to get a couple of those. <laughs> awesome. 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 Uh, I'm telling you, it, it, it is a problem. And if you want to see the difficulty in getting wing action, right. Uh, watch this video of uh, making a Kingfisher bird lure on the Marling uh, bait YouTube channel. Uh, he's the absolute king of handmade baits and an incredible lure engineer. And it's one of my favorite YouTube channels because he is just such a craftsman. I mean, anyway, get into this video, follow the link down the show notes, uh, because, uh, the artistic work he does on the floor is absolutely mind blowing, but, um, he was disappointed when he got the stream because there were some mechanical issues that he clearly hadn't anticipated. So, uh, did you notice the problem with the wing right off? I mean, or did you have to wait till he got it in the water, Tim? Well, I had to wait till he got it in the water because he is such an expert at designing these things that I never doubt that it's going to work out. But this was obviously, as from an engineering standpoint, more difficult than your a typical a large swim bait or something where the action's mostly guaranteed that it's it's going to work. So I couldn't tell. But could you tell? You design lures. Were you able to tell that it, it might not work? Well, yeah, because I, you know, he, what that what happened is, you know, you if he had the wings, they had a hinge to sweep forward. So when they threw it on the water, though, and they're flat, you know, like regular wings on a bird. Um, so as soon as he twitched it, those wings bent, you know, bent back straight, making, you know, but then there was nothing to reload them, nothing to make them pop forward again. And actually, it would make more sense if they were back swept. Uh, but even so, on the first twitch, they just sweep back against the body and stay there because there's no spring, no elastic band, no rubber, uh, connector or anything to work like a muscle, like your muscle would to pull your arm back up and work on those magnificent biceps you have. Um, <laughs> um, so the kinetic energy transfer, you know, is the real puzzler there. How would you get those wings to reset? Um, but it, it, it's really tricky. I mean, kinetic energy transfer is just, a tricky piece of engineering. I mean, would you agree? Absolutely. It's kind of like with some uh, big topwater baits, if you're trying to walk the dog with them so that, you know, it, it looks one way and then you, and it looks the other way when it works, it's great. But when you're designing a lure, it's hard to tell, is it going to get enough swing to be able to do that on a consistent basis? Or when you jerk it, is it just going to come straight at you? So yeah, these are real physics problems. And I think it's only people design a lot of lures that have a kind of an innate, innate sense for would work and what wouldn't. And he certainly does. He's it's I've spent hours and hours watching him design some of these videos. He has a sense for it, but this one did stump him a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, but I admire him for, you know, trying to take it further because the usual arrangement is to use a paddle or a propeller arrangement of some sort in top water lures. Uh, if you're going to have some sort of wings, usually it's like, you know, a paddle wheel, kind of a rotation thing is the best way to transmit the energy from the retrieve into the motion of the bug. But you know what? Hats off to Marling, you know, I mean, for even trying it. I mean, I can't do stuff like that, Tim. Jiminy, you talking to me making a hard bait with balsa wood with power tools and such? Jimmy, I counted eight places in that video where I'd have lost part of a finger, if not all of it. Uh, That's what's really amazing about this, John, is he's doing all of this by hand with wood. Now, I can see down the road as 3D printers get better, somebody designing this and then tweaking it over time. But the way he does this stuff by hand is really. Uh, really a feat and he really is an artist as you said and he has all his fingers did you know i was asked to transfer out of my shop class in junior high because i had too many accidents i mean i had a shop teacher in seventh grade who had a boston accent 
And he had lost a finger once that had been sewn back on. And he said, be careful when you're using the bandsaw to cut off your fingers. Zip, 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 just like butter. Oh, man. I tell you, you know, I'm a guy that once caused an explosion while assembling a footstool, okay? <laughs> My shop teacher, Mr. Peer, nicknamed me Fire and Blood. <laughs> Well, John, I was going to ask you to help me build a shed in the backyard, but now I think I'm going to take a hard pass on that. <laughs> Sounds safer to me. Okay, okay, now let's see what's next on our list. Oh, yeah, I like this one. This is an interesting bug. Now, while technically not a bird, uh, the Carolina Lures Yummy Bird 7-inch Flying Fish also uses wings for action. Uh, it's, it's it's a plastic bait. It looks like a silicone bait to me. But uh, anyway, it's a saltwater lure with erratic surface action. It makes a fantastic lure for tuna and dolphin and probably, I bet, uh, sailfish and stuff. You know, it looks like a really good uh, skip lure, uh, the kind that's uh, skipped on the surface or fished under a kite or, uh, or uh, along with a helium balloon. You guys are killing it now. Glad we're off of the turkey leg talk. Keep it up. There is one bird lure that really disappointed me. Oh, no, really? What was that? Well, Rapala made a set of lures based on the Angry Birds video game. There were seven lures based on the seven bird characters in the game. Well, what was wrong with them? I mean, did they not look like the video game characters? No, they look just like the video game birds, but they didn't act like the video game birds. Well, I I'm still not sure what you mean. I mean, I've never played the game, so... Okay, so here's a, a quick synopsis. In Angry Birds, you control a flock of multicolored birds that are attempting to retrieve their eggs, which have been stolen by a group of hungry green pigs. So in each stage of the game, the enemy pigs are sheltered by these different structures made of materials like wood or glass or stone. And the objective of the game is to eliminate all the pigs on the level by using a slingshot to launch birds with the goal of either striking the enemy pigs on the head or damaging the surrounding structure, causing the blocks to collapse and pop these pigs. So here's the key fact, though. There are several different types of birds used in the game, distinguished by their color and shape, like the lures. Some birds are effective against particular materials, and some have special abilities that can be activated by the player. So, for example, the yellow canary speeds up and is good for breaking right through wood or glass. And the black loon explodes. And their blue bird splits into three different birds in midair. So you get the idea. They have these different abilities. Okay, okay. So what was the problem with the lures, though? Well, they're fine crankbaits, but I fully expected them to have the same action as the video game birds. So like <laughs> <laughs> if I snagged that yellow canary on a wooden log, I expected it to split through <laughs> the log and come free. Or I expected that bluebird to split into three lures in midair. <laughs> and I thought this is going to be so cool. There's even a boomerang bird. And I thought, can you imagine being able to cast around corners with this boomerang bird? Oh, gosh darn it, Tim. That is disappointing. <laughs> I will say that each of the bird crankbaits has an angry facial expression, which is sure to taunt some bass into biting. Amen, brother. Amen. <laughs> Here's a news story for Lucy to help with. The headline is Oakland Zoo rescues pelican with fishing lure stuck in its throat. But what was actually stuck in the pelican's throat was a hook that had bait on it, not a fishing lure. Oh, well, was it a turkey leg? Well, the story doesn't clarify that point. But my question for Lucy is, should the headline have used the term fishing lure when describing a hook with bait? Or should it have read, Oakland Zoo rescues pelican with bait hooks stuck in its throat? Well, I don't think there is any question about it. It can only be attributable to human error. This sort of thing has cropped up before, and it has always been due to human error. Exemplified by the fact that they didn't consult Crappie Hippie or Tim Tacklebox Beat about our fishing lure expertise. That is right, John. All news articles about lures should be cleared through the Lure Love podcast before they are published. That is just smart journalism. How many episodes of the podcast do you guys plan to publish? Well, I don't know, 30 or 40,000. This is going to be a very, very long journey. Well, that's it for another episode of the Lure Love Podcast. Smash that like, hit that follow, and leave a nice review, too, if you would, please. But most of all, thanks for joining us. We appreciate every year. Lure Love, you've been on my mind. Never enough 
blues to tie to the end of my line. Lure, love, can't I make you see? Why buy five lures and you can buy a hundred and 